I managed the nurse helpline as well as many other things. And that's why I'm able to talk to you today about patient experience, because I talk to a lot of them. Um, and I hear the difficulties that people with Paget's disease face. And I want to tell you a little bit about the support that's available from the association. I'm also going to look at the Paget's research consultation that was in the last newsletter and what the results are from that as well. How many of you here have got Paget's disease? Do you mind putting your hands up? How many of you had a really easy diagnosis and a smooth referral to a consultant who was uh, a specialist to, to give you a full assessment? How, how easy was that, yeah? Okay. And how many of you had um, difficulties? Difficulties getting a diagnosis, late diagnosis, misdiagnosis? Okay. I'm on a helpline, so I hear about um, the difficulties a, a lot. And we were talking yesterday about um, how many x-rays are done in hospitals. And an incidental finding on the x-ray may be that, oh, by the way, there's Paget's disease in this bone, but we weren't looking for that, so we'll ignore that and forget about it. And that seems to happen too many times. Um, I hear from patients who, for years, have had pain. Their blood results just weren't quite right for a number of years but it took them many years to actually get diagnosed. So all these people have one thing in common is that they can't get a referral from their GP to a specialist for a, a proper assessment. And this is what, what some of um, the patients say that I've spoken to. And people can be quite relieved that they finally got a reason for the pain and their, their problems. Um, but commonly I hear that no one around them seems to understand it. They feel like they've hit a brick wall because nobody around them knows what's, um, what's going on. Obviously that's where the Padgett's Association comes in. We're here to provide information um, as well as help and support and also to fund research as you've heard. And we do our best to raise awareness. It's not easy, but we do our best. So we do have a lot of written information. If you don't have um, enough information, there is some of it over there on the, the table. Please do take some with you. Um, we spend a lot of time producing leaflets and newsletters, and also we've got information online as well. This is an endless list of the effects that Paget's disease can have on people. Um, by no means um, are they all on there, you know, from pain and fractures to loss of sleep, um, difficulty being able to carry out your normal job of work. Um, the potential complications, the, the list goes on quite honestly and I hear about these things all the time and that's why the Paget's Association is trying to improve the patient experience and one of the things you've heard about today are the new guidelines and good things take time, they're worth waiting for, they will come and we're working hard on those to make sure that they are the best they can be to help health professionals and yourselves make the best decisions about care and about treatment. Because that's one of the questions that people ask is, you know, how, how much treatment do I need? When do I need it? What do I need? Mm -hmm. And again, I, I hear horror stories sometimes on, on the helpline, people that have got stuck in clinics going back year after year for infusions of zoledronic acid that they don't actually need. Um, and Professor Rolston, you may have, have heard of Professor Rolston, he's a, a researcher in Edinburgh. Um, he published some research earlier this year and in February he was talking about it. It was um, intensive versus symptomatic management of Paget's disease and he said you should treat the patient and not the alkaline phosphatase level. And I think you'd all agree with that. You want to be treated as an individual, you want your symptoms to be looked at, you don't just want somebody to treat the, the test results. So to that end we are making sure that we acknowledge the centres where you can receive excellence as a patient and where there are researchers working hard to look into Paget's disease and to find better treatments and to understand more about it. Um, there are 10 centres at the moment and we are extremely lucky to have two centres in this area, so both Manchester and Salford. And we're going to add to this list very soon. So watch this space, we will, be, uh, we will be adding to that list. So other ways that we improve the patient experience then, um, well you've found one of them, you're here at an information day, and we do these as often as we can. I must say I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed with the, the numbers attending today, um, as far as patients are concerned, because when you think we've got about 1,900 members uh, all over the country, to be fair, and abroad, um, it would be nice to see more people at these days because we want to, we want to help more people, basically. 
but it is quite difficult to get to members and even to people who have never heard of the Padgett's Association before. Those are the people we really want to reach. Um, the association also has a support network. So this is where you can talk to each other. And you've got a fantastic opportunity today to speak to each other. But if you want to um, have a list of people you can talk to, then we can provide that for you. There's also an online forum. So you're welcome to join in that. And if you're in the Manchester area, or even if you're not and you want to pop in, we have got a Manchester support group. We meet in Swinton. We're meeting next week. And we're grateful to Cathy and Keith Williams, who are coming from Norton Priory. They're volunteers. And they're going to come and give us a talk entitled The Walled Garden. So if you're around next Tuesday, you're very welcome to come and join us. I mentioned that I manage the helpline, um, and that's evaluated on a six monthly basis as well. If you need us, we're there. If I don't answer your call straight away, just leave me a message. I will get back to you. We do want to talk to you. Um, and I know there's a few people um, who I'm trying to speak to today as well. So if you want to speak to me, don't rush, rush off at the end. I will be here for as long as you need me if you want um, to have a chat about anything. The Padgett's Association then, we, we've been a charity since um, 1973, so it's our 45th anniversary next year, and we are the only UK charity to focus on Padgett's disease of bone, solely. And it all began with a man called Alf who had Padgett's disease, and it began in Manchester. So Alf Stansfield had Padgett's disease, and his wife Anne decided that, oh, OK, what is it? What do we do about it? And she went to find help for her husband. And in turn, she ended up supporting a lot of people with Paget's disease. And it was in 1973 that Alan St John Dixon helped Anne to form a charity. And in, in the 1980s, the Salford Paget's disease service was established by Professor Anderson. His secretary, Tricia, helped Anne administer the charity and eventually they moved Anne out of her front room and into um, Hope Hospital, which is now known as uh, Salford Royal. So we are in the place where it all began, and Anne got recognition for her work. She received the MBE in 1996. And this is who we are today. So you've seen a lot of these people already. So you've met our president, Professor Russell. You've met Sir Henry Padgett, and Mr Ron Taft, also patron, is in the audience. You've met quite a number of our uh, trustees and our chairman, and you've heard about the, the Padgett's Association Centres of Excellence. Um, obviously myself and Sue, who you met when you came in, were the two employees for the association, so we both work full-time for the charity. And of course, we have our members and supporters um, who cycle for us, run for us, um, do all kinds of things to help support the charity. And of course, the reason we do it is for these people, all the people that are affected by, by Paget's disease. That's the reason we're here. It's the only reason we're here and we do what we do. If you um, receive the Paget's newsletter, then thank you. Um, we value your membership. And when the new guidelines are produced, when we've got any news at all to tell you, then this is where it will be. So we do value membership. Please do carry on um, receiving the newsletter. Moving on to research then, we, we know that research matters to patients because you tell us that it matters. And that's why we fund research projects, that's why we're awarding the student bursaries. And we want your opinion because at the end of the day, as I said earlier, that the people with Paget's disease, you are all that matters. You are the reason we're here. So we want your opinion. So in the last newsletter, we asked you to have your say. We asked you what research you wanted us to fund. What would be your priorities? If you were sat around that boardroom table discussing research, what would you want us to fund? I was a little bit disappointed because I think a lot of you threw it in the bin. The results so far, four people completed the form. The deadline was the 11th of September, so we've passed the deadline. Less than 1% of members actually completed my little form. So I was a little bit upset. However, I had to think about it and I thought, well, well why was there such a low response? Well, you might, members here today, you might be able to tell me, I don't know. But um, I came to the conclusion that perhaps you think that the Board of Trustees uh, are doing a great job and that you trust them to fund the right research, that perhaps they know more about it than you do and perhaps we're, we're doing a good job in what we're funding. So that was the conclusion I came to, but I'm not sure if I'm right. Um, so I'm giving you guys, who are members here today, the opportunity to change 
what at the moment is treatment should be our number one priority from those four forms. Um, do you agree with that? Do you not agree with that? I'm giving you the opportunity to tell me and I will present those results to the board. So of course, if we're going to fund research and we're going to provide services such as a helpline, then we do need funds to keep these things going. And these are just some of the ways that we fund uh, what we do. I was reminded recently that we need to still collect your used stamps. We don't get quite so many these days, but we had a lovely collection from somebody's attic of um, their stamp albums recently. And that has some considerable value. So, you know, if you've got stamp albums hiding in the attic or in the basement, or you want to just collect your stamps off your letters, then we do still um, value receiving those. What's your experience of Paget's disease then? Keep telling us, keep talking to us. Um, if you need information or support, then please keep coming to us and tell us what research we should prioritise. We're here to help you. I'm going to talk about my experience of uh, having my leg straightened at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital at, at Stanmore. Um, the title of my presentation is Straightening My Leg, but actually, after I'd had the operation, that's more um, reflects how I felt. My goodness, what had I done when I woke up um, and, and saw what they'd done to my leg? But more about that in just a second. So I feel it's important to set the scene so you know a little bit about me um, and a bit, little bit about my background. Um, I'm age 57, clearly not in this photograph. Um, this, is me, this is me age seven, seven years old. Um, butter wouldn't melt in my mouth. Um, well, perhaps my parents didn't actually believe that. But uh, anyway, but I had a fairly, fairly normal upbringing. Um, I'm one of three children. Um, this is me age 16 in the middle. Great flares, as you can tell, very much, uh, very much of the time. But middle, middle child. And, uh, and I joined the army in 1978, went to Sandhurst and was commissioned into the Royal Corps Signals. You can try and work out which one is me is in the picture. I've got a picture at the end which will show which one it is, but some of the eagle eye may be able to spot me. They're really difficult, those sort of pictures. I'm married to Mandy, um, who's, who's over there. We've been married 35 years. Um, and, uh, and I've also, um, I was in the army for, um, for, for just over 37 years. I was medically retired from the, from the army um, in 2015. And, we have uh, four grown-up children, um, and now um, we have four grandchildren. Okay, so Paget's and Paget's um, and me. I was diagnosed with Paget's disease in the autumn of 2014. Um, I'd had some, um, I was still in the army at that stage, I'd had, had to have some um, surgery on my right ankle because I, I damaged it and it needed, the ankle needed to be fused. And so, and I had that, um, that operation done um, and as part of the recovery process, um, I ended up at Headley Court, the Defence Medical Rehabilitation Centre at Headley Court, in, which is in Surrey. Um, and during the, uh, my recovery, um, I started to have trouble with my leg. I had a lot of pain um, in my lower right leg. I, I had a lot of swelling. The, the, the bone became very hot and was extremely painful to touch. Um, and it was clear that something was not quite right. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, I had some investigations done and Paget's disease was diagnosed. And um, here is the photographic evidence. The, um, that's my bone scan done in December 14. And as you can see, there's the Paget's disease clearly in the, um, in the right tibia. And it was, it was very active. Um, interestingly enough, my, my ALP, my alkaline phosphatase level, was not unusually elevated. So um, the, most of the evidence that I had the disease was, was initially from, from imaging. But uh, the disease, by the time it was discovered, the disease had already done its damage. Um, and you can see in the picture on the right-hand side, that's my, that's my tibia, that's the front of my leg there. And you can see, um, you can see the, the, uh, the, the clear bowing, and that's a, 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 a two leg standing, and you can, you can see the difference between the left and the, and the right leg. And you can see the classic thickening that you get um, um, on, the, on the tibia. Um, and the one in the middle is just, this is a normal photo, but, but actually you can, you can clearly see the, the, bow in, the bow in my leg. And it was giving me a lot of trouble. Um, 
Um, it was giving me an awful lot of trouble and pain, um, and I was finding it increasingly difficult to walk. In fact, I was reduced to walking with a stick, um, and um, it was getting worse. The pain was getting worse um, in my leg. I had been treated for the disease, obviously, but the, but the deformity in my leg um, was affecting my walking, was affecting my knee, it was affecting my, my ankle, my foot was my right foot was, was, was turned out, was everted, so it actually was, it was pretty painful to walk. Um, and, I had a, and I had a lot of bone pain, still not directly because of the Paget disease, it's because of the deformity and the loading, the mechanical loading on my leg. I was very fortunate being treated at Stanmore that, that my, um, my Paget's consultant, um, as they, surgeon, um, uh, doctors always have mates, um, and elsewhere in the hospital, um, there is a specialist limb reconstruction surgeon. Um, and my Paget's consultant um, said, oh, I've got a, I've got a colleague um, who specialises in limb reconstruction, um, and I think, I think we can do something. I think we can have a go at straightening your leg, because it needs to, otherwise you're going to have quite serious issues later on. So, um, so I saw him, and, and he said, yep. He said, I can definitely help you. You're, you're young, you're strong, um, and, uh, um, and I think we can, uh, we can get a good result. So, on the 27th of October, 16, I had the operation at, at, at Stanmore. Um, and, uh, and you can see when I woke up, I had all this clobber on my leg. Um, and it's like a giant, giant Meccano set. Um, I'm an engineer by, by, by profession, so I'm interested in, the, in these sort of things. But, but you give an orthopedic surgeon some, some tools and bits of metal, and this is, this is the, the wonders that they can create. Um, and so what you're seeing there is a is what's known as a four-ring Taylor spatial frame. Um, and the top and the bottom ring um, are there to, to anchor the frame to, to your leg, and, they're, and, and, the, and it's fixed to your leg using wires, and they go right through, right through the leg, right through the bone. So those provide your top and bottom anchor. And the two middle rings are the, are the clever bit that, that do all the work, um, and they're connected to, to, the, to the tibia, um, using three half, half pins or half bolts. They look, bolt, look like bolts because they're jolly big. Um, and, they, and, they're, and they're drilled into the tibia. So they break your tibia and your fibula. Um, then they build this lot around you. Um, and uh, and the, the clever bit is, is, as I say, is the, the two rings in the middle, which are connected together by six adjusters, um, which by moving them, you can move the, the relative position um, of, 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 the, of the broken bones, uh, the broken tibia in the leg. It's, it's, it's very clever, and you can move it in, in 360 degrees. So by doing that, they can actually move the bone to actually get it into, into alignment. And the key thing was to get my, my, um, my hip, my knee, and my ankle back into line, because, because the disease had bent my leg, they were no longer in line. In order to do the straightening, you do daily frame adjustments. So, and we started those um, a week after the operation. So I was in, the, I was in hospital for, for, the, for the first week, and on the last day, we started daily frame adjustments, which actually involves a spanner, a torch, so you can actually see what you're doing, um, and a chart. Um, and and I've, I've put one example of a chart up on the left-hand side there, but we actually had lots of charts because it took about seven weeks to do all the, uh, to do all the adjustments. But each of, those, each of these adjusters... Which are, which, which are here, they're, they're, they're color-coded, they've got a little collar on them, um, and they relate to the columns that are on that sheet. And it gives you a number, and it tells you what the setting of each of those adjusters should be. And every day, my wife Mandy um, did the adjustment using a 10 mil spanner and a, and a torch, so she could see what we're doing, um, and, and, and adjusted them. And typically, um, we would we, the adjustment for each adjuster would be about between one and two millimeter change a day, either up or, or down, depending on which strut it was. Some days, some of them didn't, didn't, didn't change at all. But it's, it's a pretty painstaking mechanism um, to, uh, to do. You have to go around, you have to be quite diligent, do the change, and then lock it all off. So uh, it was fun and something to look forward to every day. And some days were more, as we move the bone, depending on where it was, some days it was more painful than others. Living with a frame, um, I need to talk about pin site management because it's all well and good making the adjustments, but you actually have to manage all the metal work that's going through your leg. 
because the frame, as I said, is attached to your leg, um, and in my case, I had 15 pin sights. I had six wires that went right through my leg, and I had three half pins that went into, into the tibia. And, and as a, all our doctors here will, will say, you know, if you've got holes through leg and you've got metal work going through, it's a highway for infection. So keeping, keeping the, the, uh, the pin sites, the, the, the wounds, um, clean was absolutely vital. Um, and it was, a, um, and it was a, not a daily activity, but a weekly activity. Um, the wounds themselves are, are actually covered with a, with a, with a small foam dressing um, just to keep daily debris out. But every five to seven days, you have to remove that. You have to, you have to clean the site with, with, great, with great care um, and, and, then, and then redress it. What that means is because you, you've got dressings on all the time, you can't, you can't wash as normal. Um, you, get a, you get a shower once a week. Every, on the day that you do the dressing change, you take the old dressings off, you go in the shower, have a, have a shower as normal, um, and then the, then the wounds are redressed. Other days you just flannel wash. These, that's the practicalities of living, uh, of living with a frame. And also getting the right supplies. One of the, we had lots and lots of issues with, with the GP and the pharmacist getting all the right dressings and um, cleaning fluid and all sorts of things. It, it really was quite a struggle, um, even though it, we clearly um, laid out what it was that was required. Um, it was really quite a struggle. It took a long time before we finally got it right. You need lots of patience and, and diligence and care. Mandy provided all of that in looking, o in looking after me. And you always have to have antibiotics on hand, as I mentioned. You know, metal work going through bones is a highway for, for infection, and so they were always on hand because if you've got an infection, it needs to be treated absolutely without delay. Here we go, progress, watching the bone grow, or waiting for the bone to grow. Um, and it really does, um, watching or waiting for the bone to grow um, makes, that, makes watching paint dry look like a sprint event. Um, it, is, it, is, it is very slow. And here is some um, time-lapse pictures which show the progress of the bone growing back into the fracture in the, in the tibia. And I'll, I'll bring them all up now. And you can see they're taking about a month apart. Um, and if we start with this one, 16th of December. So this is, so after seven weeks of doing adjustments, which from the operation, the 16th of December was when, was when we'd finished making the adjustments to the frame and it was locked off. And at that stage, you can see there's the, there's the osteotomy, the fracture that, that was put into, into, into the tibia. It was done using, when I asked them, I said, how, how, how did you break the bone in my leg? Well, it was a chisel and a hammer. So it's as brutal as that. Um, anyway, so, so there's, there's the fracture, and, there's a, and the fibula, which is this bone here, and there's a, another fracture down, down here. So a month later, you can just start to see that it's going a bit misty um, in, uh, in there. We called it, Mandy and I called it bone fluff, watching, watching it, this sort of misty um, substance appear in, in, in the fracture. On the 13th of, of February, which is um, down here, you can actually really start to see now how that fracture is, um, is, uh, is, is healing. And even more so here, another month um, later, we've really, got some, we've got really got some good bone growth. And on the 13th of March, they took the bottom ring, the, the, the uh, the fourth ring, the ankle ring, off the frame. Um, so, and that was a blessed relief, actually, because, because, the, because the wires that go through your leg, um, the bottom ring had, had two wires that, that go, go through the ankle, um, and it's really, at the bottom of the tibia, really, really painful. And it used to rip the flesh when you walked on it because, it, because it, it, things stretched. Um, and so I was able to walk so much better once that had been removed. 30th of March, um, they, uh, they, took, they took the frame off um, and put the plaster on. Um, it was done under general anaesthetic um, because it's quite painful taking those, those half pins out of the, uh, out, out of the tibia. Um, and also they, they give your leg at that stage a really good workout to see how strong the fracture is and see how well it's healed. Um, and it bleeds a lot. Pagetic bone um, is, tends to be quite vascular and, and it bleeds a lot. And there is a good example. It took three hours for the bleeding to stop. Um, after surgery, before they then gave me an above-knee plaster, which I then wore um, for a month. And here, was, and here is the, the finished result. So this is where we started. There is the, um, the sabre, the classic sabre-shaped 
um, tibia, which we started with, and that's the result after surgery. And you can see how it's, it's straightened and everything's nicely back in line. You can still see the fracture, in the, the original fracture in the tibia there, and the fibula um, fracture there, which is still, still healing. That's, that's still not fully united. Um, and actually, the scarring, even though I've got 15 pin site um, wounds on my leg, they have actually healed quite well. Those three that you can see there are where the three half pins went through the, uh, went through the tibia. Um, and that's me um, walking. I, in, in terms of progression, you start, you start weight bearing, um, ideally from day one, because um, weight bearing promotes bone growth. Um, so I started off with crutches and then progressively, um, as, as I was able to put more weight through it, and particularly when they took the bottom ring off, I moved, I moved to, to two sticks and then to one. And as you can see, uh, at the moment, I don't have any, which is, which is good. I do have a bit of a limp, though. For completeness, here is the summary, and you can see how long the whole process took. And it took six months, basically. And to give my surgeon, Peter Calder, uh, the limb reconstruction surgeon at, uh, at Stanmore, credit, he said, it will take six months. And almost exactly to the day, it took six months. So th we started the frame adjustment a week after the surgery. It took seven weeks for all the adjustments to be done. About three and a half months after surgery, they took the bottom ring off. The frame came off at five months, plaster on for a month, and then we were all done at six months. And then it was just what they call consolidation. So that the progress review that I had on the 31st of July, the intervening period was just to allow the bone to continue to, to harden and, and, and strengthen. So, um, so, so that's good. And where, and it's been, a, I think we can safely say, it's been a success. So, and when I was writing this, I thought, well, just a little, little bit of reflection. I thought, what sort of questions might people be interested in? You know, because you might, well, you might be in the situation like, like me, um, or you might know somebody in a situation like me. You know, what was, it, what was it really like? Was it easy? You know, how much support did I need? Well, actually, I needed, in, like, like any major orthopedic surgery, or any major surgery, um, but particularly orthopedic surgery, in the early stages, I needed lots of lots of support. I was incredibly reliant on my wife Mandy, in fact, th through the whole process, and I couldn't have done it without, without her. Um, I needed lots of one-to-one -one care initially, right at, right at the beginning. I couldn't do anything for myself, mostly because I couldn't, I couldn't walk properly, and I certainly couldn't feed myself, and I needed help washing, and all those, and all those, those sort of things. So it, it's not to be undertaken necessarily for the faint-hearted. Was it painful? Well, well, yes, and I think my very first slide illustrated that it's quite painful because when, when I woke up after the surgery, I thought, goodness, what have they done to me? Well, they've broken my leg in two places and drilled lots of holes and stuck metalwork on me. So why, why should it be surprised? But again, in terms, of, in terms of pain and pain management, it's all about finding the right, the right combination of drugs that work for, that work for you and, and make your life easier. I got on very well with paracetamol, perhaps not surprisingly, and tramadol. Um, I didn't like morphine, um, or, and, it, and it doesn't like me very much, and I tried to avoid it. But yes, it was painful, but it got better. And, and, you, and I think all the, particularly those of us who've experienced pain, um, as a, particularly as a result of Paget's, is you, your tolerance of pain um, gets better the more you get used to it. What about clothing? Well, it is one of those things, when you've got a socking great piece of metalwork on your leg, um, normal clothes don't fit. So things like underwear, pyjamas, trousers, all those sort of things, you have to make special provision. Um, and, uh, and you have to find things that have a big enough aperture to fit over the frame. But we were very fortunate, we found some, some excellent tracksuit trousers that got zips that go all the way up, so we could just unzip them and I could put them on. So I lived in, in tracksuit bottoms for about um, for nearly six months. But you have to think about things like that. And did I need special equipment? Well, beyond clothing, yep, I needed, I needed help, help in the house, things like like a, a perching stool and a shower stool um, and crutches and sticks um, and things to keep the bed clothes initially and certainly initially to keep them off my legs and that and that sort of thing but um, you become you become very inventive you find lots of ways of doing things and coping um, um, but but yes you do need you do need some some specialist bits bits and pieces and how much rehab did I need well actually not a huge amount um, I'm we managed to do most of, it at, most of it at home. I did have physiotherapy, normally about every three to four weeks, just to sort of monitor my progress. They, they wouldn't let me leave hospital initially until I could demonstrate that I could walk with a, 
walk with a with a with a set of crutches, and I could actually go upstairs. Um, but but during during my recovery process, um, I didn't have lots of lots of it. The key th the key thing is actually walking and and doing as much weight bearing as you can. Um, and then later on, they're interested in in getting you to re re to regain range of range of motion. And I and I've and I've maintained or recovered most of the range of motion in my um, in my right leg, which is pretty good. And here's the key question: Would I do it again? Well, the answer is yes. Um, and it, and it's it's it's, um, it's slightly more surprising is that on the 16th of October, um, so in a, in a few weeks' time, I'm I am actually going to have it done again. But this time on the on my left leg, not because of Paget's disease, but because of one of the, the consequences of having it done on my on my right leg is that they lengthened my leg by by uh, as a result of straightening it, um, and it's now an inch longer than my left leg. And I don't know if you can see from here, but I've got a I've got a shoe raise on, so my my uh, my left leg um, is uh, is an inch shorter than my right leg, so I've got to have my um, my left leg lengthened. So I've actually got to go through exactly the same process again for about six months or so. That picture, can you guess which one I am? But I am that fresh-faced chappy just there. That's me. So that's my story, ladies and gentlemen. I hope it was interesting. Well, the whole day, really, we've been hearing about uh, Paget's research and the difference it has made to, to patients. Uh, this association was established as the National Association for Research into Paget's disease. And over the 40 years that, that we've been in existence, uh, it, they have funded, uh, the National Association, then the Paget's Association has funded a lot of research. And a lot of the research I'm going to talk about today has been funded by the Paget's Association. This is the real past. This, this is the, the start. This is Sir Julian Paget's first, first patient. You heard about him earlier. The Grenadier Guard who went into the forces and outgrew all the hats that were available to the members of that particular band of happy men. And uh, you can see here, this first patient was described in the transactions there. He was actually presented at a Medcur uh, Society meeting in London before then in 1876. And I recommend any student and even patients today, I say go and get that article out. It's easy to get hold of it and read it. It is a fascinating description. It's fascinating research on Paget's disease. The description is just as valuable today as it was when Sir James Paget first presented it. It's very accurate. The dissections of, uh, of the changes that had gone on, this first patient actually died of something that I hope we don't ever see with Paget's patients now, of heart disease. Yeah, I mentioned the, the blood pooling and the blood problem. If you slice through a Paget's bone, it's highly vascular. And that gentleman actually died of high output cardiac failure. Uh, and so that uh, established research that had to do something about that high metabolic uh, bone problems and uh, we needed to, to, to do further research. And it's taken a lot of time to still not know exactly what causes Paget's disease. We had a little debate earlier, and I'm going to fill in some of the, the holes in, in what we discussed earlier. I'm going to talk to you about the changing prevalence, the incidence and severity. What, what does that mean? For, well, it appears there are less Paget's patients. That's not quite true for the centres of excellence. I get one new Paget's patient referred to me every three weeks. I know others aren't seeing that, but the reason I'm seeing that is I've gone to an area of high Paget's prevalence where the GPs say, one, I know nothing about the condition and there's no treatment for it. And the patients have to find out via Diana or somebody else, as we heard today, that there is treatment for Paget's disease. And there's a guy called Fraser and a few others around the country who actually will give treatment for Paget's disease. But I still don't believe, I came into this game 30 years ago, I'm getting into my anecdotage now, and uh, I still don't believe that there are GPs out there that say there's no treatment for Paget's disease. Can you believe it, Mike? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. 
Uh, and we got, there's something wrong here, but the, the prevalence is changing, the incidence is changing, the severity is changing. I'm going to put this slide up. You've seen it before, that uh, Bermuda Triangle there. I'm going to come back to that in the, a little later in the presentation. The hotspot of Lancashire and Lancaster. All sorts of reasons why that hot spot exists. I moved from Liverpool to Norwich. I should have gone from the same incidence to the same incidence prevalence. I should have had, I had 300 patients that Anna now looks after in Liverpool, round about that, yeah. I should have had 300 patients in Norwich. How many did I have when I went to Norwich? 25. Where were they all? less severe, not diagnosed, certainly not been referred to the rheumatology service or anybody else in Norwich. And so there's all the patients. That's why I'm seeing one every three weeks. But the research says I should be seeing less. I'm actually seeing more at this moment in time, Paget's disease. But you can see there's hot spot right here. We'll come back to that. Lancaster and Lancashire. Why would there be a hot spot there? The genetic factors, or is it, is it that virus? Is it, is it these viruses? Is it the canine distemper virus that's important there? Is the disease actually disappearing? Well, the research that's out there says it is. You saw a bit from, from Terry O'Neill. Here's a, a meta-analysis of a load of studies around the world. And the, the, the lighter the color goes, the less the Paget's disease is there. And what we've got is where it was about 10 years ago, and you can see the UK's black as coal there, greater than 5% incidence in patients over 50. And now here with the Cyrus Cooper and other studies, we're down to half that. So we're, we're, we're sitting around the, the 2 to 3 percent. And the fascinating thing is when you look all around the world at where surveys have been done 10 years ago and have been repeated, there we go, there's Australia, 1978. But when you repeat it, or, or in, in New Zealand and Auckland, you repeat it in 1983, a significant reduction in the incidence. We're seeing less pageants patients, less severe disease. Why is that? That comes back to maybe the etiology. We're going to discuss the etiology. Is it a genetic dilution effect? Did the, the founder effect of all these people going down here to here suddenly get diluted out because the gene pool gets diluted? Or is it that we're not seeing the triggering factor anymore? This is important research for us because I'm going to be out of a job in a few years time and I'm going to have no Paget's patients to look after. I don't think it's quite going to be like that. We ask you, what would you like us to research into? This shows you the, the presentation changing. This is from, from my pal Stuart. Stuart and I have worked together for over 30 years, a lot of that time on, on Paget's research. So Stuart looked at studies down the years, how many there were, patients, here you can see quite a significant number of patients, and what was their presenting complaint. And what we're seeing is a change in the presentation, less deformity, less of that requirement, as we've just heard well, for the, 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 the saber tibia being straightened. And the major concern, the major presenting complaint actually now is pain. So there's been a big change in the disease and of course the pain presents a lot later in the disease and so the patients present later and if there's less of them getting it we see less patients less severe disease but the major complaint when patients come along is pain so what we need to treat what the research says we need to treat and what we need to be researching into is the pain that patients experience from from Paget's disease and, and in previous surveys and I didn't mention the previous survey we, we did, pain was a major concern to, to patients with Paget's disease, something we need to do about. This is, this is interesting, this is, this is varied. I actually did a survey, it's not, not in the presentation, we looked at deafness, and the prevalence of deafness is far, far higher than that. If you actually formally test Paget's patients, the, the, the relatives say, 
they can hear the television five blocks down because he has it so high. And I'll say, do you think you're feeling deaf? And he'll say, no, there's nothing wrong. It's 1720, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's a real problem. Deafness has been underestimated in, in Paget's patients, but you can see the sort of variation in it as a presenting complaint. But I think deafness is far, far greater uh, than that in, in Paget's patients. Now then, the controversy. What causes Paget's disease? As we've heard today a little bit, the, the, the virus stories come out. The, the, the virus gets into the cells, sits there for a while, a bit like Kuru and, and, and animal models and, and other diseases, sits there for a while and alters the osteoclast. And the, the viruses that have been said to do this are all part of a mix of viruses, the measles, the canine distemper virus, and the respiratory sensitial virus. And it depends where you are in the world, what your favorite virus is, and who's researched it, and who believes what. But here's an interesting one. Remember those Lancastrian mills? We uh, gave some money to a researcher who looked at the map of the canals and the mill towns of Lancaster, and the incidence of Paget's disease increased the greater the number of mills and the mills that were, were there. And he put that down to the aniline dyes, the chemical changes. Darrell talked about the changes in cells that can happen. Well, you can do that chemically. And these dyes that were used in cotton wax are very unpleasant dyes. They cause major nucleic acid changes. They could have been the factor that, that, that influenced the external agent that caused major problem in cotton preparation. Then around Lancaster, and then as they allowed the filth and the chemicals to roll down into Manchester and Liverpool. That's why their incidence could be higher. I've got another one for you in a minute, though, which I think is even better. It's all my own work. Biological vitamin D deficiency. We know that it's not only the northern towns, but, but the slum areas in, in those towns and the lack of sunlight. And, and we know one of the problems in a previous guideline was there was a mention of hyperparathyroidism being high in, in patients with Paget's disease. It turns out that's due to vitamin D deficiency. They get secondary hyperparathyroidism. And uh, so vitamin D deficiency might be a, an associated factor. And, and, and cytokines that result in uh, the, the osteitis deformis, the inflammation that's there, may, may be factors. And then there are certain occupations that come up all the time. Being a postman, maybe that's being bitten by the dogs. Is that it? We, we've got army life, soldiers. We just heard a story of a soldier, didn't we? Stressing the, the yomping, the, the marching, the, the continual loads. Interesting. And rural life, being a cooper, being a man that works as a blacksmith. These are, they come up often enough, you look at not enough data to say this is a definite association, but when we do the studies, when you look back through all the data, these are professions that pop up. Now, the virus cause. There's the first electron microvamp published by Fred Singer and Mills and Reddy. And the arrow's pointing here, and you can't quite see it, and you've got to look very hard, even on the, the quality pictures that, 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 that were published. And he says there's a, just there, you can look at it, there's a sort of rhomboid structure that's a viral particle. And that's a paramix of virus. Yep, we're convinced. Well, that's the, that was the first. And a series of pictures like that, I could show you half a dozen pictures like that, all throughout the world, all putting different viruses. The canine distemper virus theory was put forward in Manchester by Anderson and me. Measles virus gets strong support from Dave Rudman, San Antonio, USA. And the respiratory syncytial virus, Sam Marie Singer and Jack Brown. I'll give you an alternative. There are other animals carry the canine distemper virus. Here's the reason why it's prevalent in Lancaster. This little fella, the ferret, 
He's loaded with canine distemper virus. And if you partake of activities like this, ah, your little nibbly bits are getting nibbled. Yeah. And uh, that might be the reason that canine distemper virus is, is high in Lancaster. Is it? Strong association. The other animal that carries the canine distemper virus and highly prevalent in Lancaster is, of course, the vampire bat. He carries it. So going out at night getting nibbled by the vampire bat might do it. I'm being a little facetious. And the reason I'm being facetious is Graham didn't go to this bit of the story. I and others hunted for viral DNA over a 10 year period in loads of Paget samples. We took biopsies, we got bone from good volunteers who gave us their bone. We could find no evidence of any viral particles using sensitive methods of PCR. And just below that, we decided, okay, we'll do a multinational study, an international study. We will blindly circulate material to everybody containing increasing amounts of viral particles. There will be controls with nothing in it. And we'll send this round blind and everybody who is involved in the research will tell us what they find. Well, the first thing that happened was Dave Rudman, the measles proponent, declined to take part. Fair enough. We got the National Virus Laboratory involved. They were brilliant. They could detect four or five viruses in the samples that we put out. They were clearly the best. The rest of us, we were sort of hiddle diddle in the middle. We obviously didn't get down to the low values, so you could argue we did miss some virus particles, and therefore that was a problem. But in truth, I think we were pretty confident if we say there's no virus particles, there's no virus particles, confirming this. But what was fascinating, and poor Andy Mee had to hold up his hands, his lab was completely contaminated with canine distemper virus. And the reason he got 100% positivity is the lab was awash with CDV. But he held his hands up and he said, okay, I need to clean out my lab. I'll do it all again. And he got the same results as the rest of us when he did that. But that raised the spectre that the Manchester theory of the canine distemper virus and the ferret down the trousers might not be the cause. So do we know the cause? Well, you've heard today a lot about the genetics. I won't go over everything on it, but sequestasome, very important. The values of 50%, that's in Liverpool. The, my population and now Anna's population in Liverpool are very high sequestasome. And of course, if you have sequestasome, your penetrance of, and your ability to hand it on to your children in Liverpool and in the UK is very high. Jack Brown in Canada doesn't see this penetrance at all, but he maybe have an entirely different type of genetic profile in his patients. So, but this is very interesting, and I'll see how this research has led down to some what I think is very important research in uh, how do we prevent Paget's in the next generations, how do we treat it? How, is there a way of stopping this go, going forward uh, in our children and our, and our relatives who could be affected? There are a whole load of other mutations. Many in the room have contributed to the, the research on this, but I come back to Meep Helfrich published this. Now, there are those octagonal, those rhomboidal, those Paramix of it, but have a look closer. What's that? And if I went back to the Fred Singer photograph, you'd see these linear things. And what she did is she rotated the electron micrograph, and these become that. So they're not paramix of virus particles at all. What the proposal is, these are the things that Rob's looking at. These are abnormal proteins that are produced inside these cells as a result of the genetic abnormalities. The things that my colleague has been looking at, the changes in the proteins in the cell that actually are probably the true cause 
What triggers it, we still don't know. It could be a susceptible population exposed to the triggering agent. But what those things are inside those cells seen in electromicrographs are actually abnormal proteins. They're not particles. And that's why they don't stain up with antibodies to the proteins and why you never see them when we do PCR reactions and things like that. They don't exist uh, at a concentration high enough for us to be able to pick them up. So we still don't know. I think there's certainly a susceptible population genetically, but we're still not 100% sure what the triggering agent could be. It could be the aniline dyes, it could be vitamin D, it could be something else. And in fact, David Rudman recently has been publishing a lot on cytokine effects and vitamin D effects integrated in with the measles virus and its resulting in changes that he thinks would lead to Paget's disease. And he had a, a number of lovely presentations at the SBMR. He's kind of, it, this field, we were all knocking lumps out of one another. We've kind of moved a little bit towards him, and he's moved a little bit towards those of us who said it wasn't a, a viral problem. Now then, treatment. My last little section. We've heard a lot about treatment. We've heard of the zoledronic acid being a, a major factor. Now, a study sponsored by the NARPD in Sheffield, when, when Graham was there, Eugene McCloskey and, and uh, Sohil Khan, they looked at giving bisphosphonates and getting the alkaline phosphatase as low as they could, treating with the drug that was then available, which was clodronate. And what they showed, and it was quite clear, the lower they got the alkaline phosphatase, the better the response in patients. So Stuart Ralston and I were stuck in Copenhagen coming back from a meeting and it was snowing and we were going nowhere and we had a little discussion about what research we thought we should do and we came up that night with the idea of that, that idea of lowering the alt-foss. Why don't we divide Paget's patients into two one group will only treat if they get pain, if they get problems, we'll give them treatment. The other group will constantly treat them to bring that measure, the alkaline phosphatase, down into the reference range. And will it make a difference in fractures, deformity, or, or the deafness? There's, there's Beethoven again. Sounds a good idea. Got funded. NARPD, Paget's Association, contributed a chunk to it. Lots of patients, some of the room might have taken in part. It was called the PRISM study, intensive against symptomatic treatment as the, the ISA. But 1,324 patients all over the UK, patients took part. We were looking at all sorts of outcome. You can see here the treatments that were given at the time. We didn't have zoledronate, so calcitonin was still using a few, etidronate, taludronate, resedronate, pomidronate. That was the most potent bisphosphonate we had at the time. Did it work? Well, the group treated intensively. The vast majority of them normalized their alt-foss and we maintained it in the reference range. The group that were treated who were symptomatic, as you can see, the vast majority, it's sl the slightly lowering of the alt-foss, but they weren't in the reference range. Good so far. The disappointment starts and goes on from here onwards. No difference in the prevention of fractions in the symptomatic arm against the intensive arm. No difference in operative outcomes, the requirement for surgery. No difference in the requirement for arthritic procedures. No difference in quality of life assessed by SF36, and there was a whole load of other ways we looked at quality of life. Absolutely no difference in, in any of the domains. So in summary, PRISM, the intensive treatment, so hitting somebody with a bisphosphonate, every time their biochemistry looked like it was creeping up, and you know, outside it did not work. It didn't improve quality of life or bodily pain. Unlike the calcitonin, 
paper published by Bowen, it made not a blind bit of difference to hearing, did not reduce the requirement for surgery or joint replacement. So why didn't it work? Well, lots of people, especially Americans, were critical of us and we get it in the neck, or we were getting it in the neck from Ian Reid for a while and others. The serum alt fos levels were not normalized in everybody, but only in 80% of the patients that were in the intensive arm. So the criticism, you didn't get them all treated properly. And would now zoledronate was available, would zoledronate make a difference? And of course, if you look at the zoledronate data, it's been alluded to earlier, this is the publication that uh, was mentioned. There's residronate, there's zoledronate, a significant improvement in response. Everybody down in the reference range and the longevity of response at last, as you saw that paper that was up out to six and a half years. So, what do you do? We had the two cohorts. We could now give the symptomatic group more potent bisphosphonates if we wanted to, but we didn't. We gave the other group zoledronate. Should make a difference. Biochemically, a major difference. Everybody is now down in the reference range. But hold on a minute. Symptomatic, intensive. Significantly more fractures and orthopedic procedures are now required in the group that get walloped with zoledronate every time the ALKFOS comes up. This is why we do research. This is why Stuart, and to a certain extent now it's changed my feeling about it, I don't wallop somebody with zoledronate every time they blink and their ALKFOS shifts. We treat patients symptomatically. This is a major saving, if you follow this and to its natural conclusion, this is a major saving for NHS resources in terms of treatment for Paget's disease. So there was no additional benefit from intensive treatment with the potent bisphosphonate, and in fact, it might be detrimental to patients. So when your physician says, I don't think I'll give you that infusion for whatever he had a good reason for not doing it, it may be your pain is not Paget's pain, and maybe there's some other reason for the pain. So don't pillory your expert because he hasn't given you the infusion that time. There's lots of evidence that's saying that may not be the best treatment for you at that time. Maybe you need to go and have a bit of surgery. Maybe you need something else. Maybe there's something else gone wrong. One of the problems, of course, we step in late in the process. And so this study is the last treatment slide. Zip came in, patients who were identified with a sequestosome mutation. Their children were tested. If they have the mutation, they're given a choice to go into a study receiving residulate or a placebo. And that study is still ongoing. We haven't broken the code yet. We're starting to get the data. I think we've got a telephone call next month where the first of the data might be available to us. But it's a very important study, isn't it? Because it says there might be a way we can prevent some of the more serious consequences of Paget's disease by giving treatment early. And today you've heard a lot about all the things we will, we will do. And the next study that's being sponsored, one of the studies that's being sponsored by the Paget's Association is looking into pain and hopefully all the Paget's centers will get involved in that work. We are looking for better markers of disease. Maybe it will be microRNAs. Maybe they'll help us. Maybe a genetic risk score will come out. We haven't heard much about denosumab. My experience of a denosumab is one good, three bad. We need a proper randomized trial to decide whether it actually works. You've heard about the microRNA and the archeology. span that's, that's fascinating. That may help us to, to decide what's been happening with Paget's disease and the changes down the years. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. I hope you uh, agree with me. We have moved things forward in the last 40 years, and the NARPD and the Pagets Association have been pivotal uh, in, in making that difference. Thank you very much.